presentation once, my fresh out of getting my doctorate, and uh, I did this presentation at the College Music Society, and we had problems with the technology. <coughs> and one thing I learned from years of teaching elementary kids is when, when little ones before a concert, everything's a crisis. <coughs> oh my God, yes. And I learned very quickly. Holy cow, it is. He talked like this and said, Spencer, have a seat. It was his yep. name, Spencer, have a seat. Have a seat. <laughs> yep. And so I really worked yep. at that year after year instead of, okay. oh my God, what do we have? That, that works really well with elementary kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, show them calm, have a seat. It's a broken string. I will fix it. High school student, can you help? Thank you so much. Okay, I'll be right back. Um, like I had three or four scotches or something, <laughs> uh, which was not the case. Uh, do not recommend that. Um, so I'm doing this CMS presentation, and there's a problem with the technology, and suddenly my connector, my dongle, would not work. And so I'm, I grab my coffee for some reason, and do you have? To, thank you so much. One of the professors had a dongle, and I'm trying to remain calm. They're frantically doing this. My time's slipping away because you only have 25 minutes for a presentation, and um, I'm sitting here. Okay, we'll get it fixed. And I think that that elementary thing kicked in where I'm nice and calm. Well, I didn't realize the rest of my presentation I presented to these very, like, um, big name academics in the audience with a coffee cup in my hand the whole time. I left it in my hand. And boy, did one of my mentors uh, from Northwestern come up to me afterward, bought me a beverage and said, are you where you presented with a coffee cup in your hand the whole time? That's not something you do. So I'm very mindful of that. So I actually always take a sip before I present. <laughs> and I put it down. There's my, there's my story. Thank you for coming. Picture is worth a hundred-ish words. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a lectern to kind of look at what I have here, so I apologize for looking back at the board from time to time. Um, some thoughts that encourage us, by the way, that is probably the most seventh grade picture of all my you know, seventh graders. Uh, the one young man is now a, a professional living in Boston, and the young lady is in the military, uh, stationed in Germany. And so both bass players, uh, it's great when you have those kids that start in fourth grade and go all the way up through high school mm -hmm. together. I taught in a small town in Northwest Ohio uh, for 10 years, uh, four through 12. I was the only orchestra teacher. In Ohio, I was able to see my fourth graders through eighth graders five days a week if I wanted to. And then high school, right. And, and when I moved to New York and encountered the pull-out lesson concept, it's still rather new to me. Um, but you get to know those kids really, really well in that sense. So one thing, um, I'm not here to I don't know any more than anybody in here. I'm just older than a lot of you. <laughs> and, I, and I've done this for a little longer than some of you. Uh, but I, I want to share some, some, um, some things that I did with my kids as a school teacher, make some connections to the research practitioner literature. But this is more of a, a teacher-friendly session, I hope. Um, the 70-30 thing, 70% uh, musical activity, 30% uh, non-musical in a lesson. That's something that always stuck with me. My mentor always said, research suggests that if you're talking or not playing more than 30% of the rehearsal, it's not a good thing. So try that. And most new teachers, they time themselves and it tends to be 40, 60 the other direction. They tend to stop, rehearse a measure, and then four score and seven years ago, our founding fathers invented F sharp on the D string violas. You need to do this. And they go into long verbal <coughs> diatribes. And how can we encourage learning without words a little bit more? in the rehearsal. The remember to or make sure you think. If you came last night, you know, that's one of my uh, my pet peeves is is when I watch a student teacher and I talk to them afterward, if you say like, okay, let's stop violas, remember to make those C-sharps nice and high. Okay, let's move on. It didn't sink in. Mm -hmm. Or make sure you do this. Instead of actually <coughs> striking while the iron's hot, showing, involving some modeling, some echoing back and forth, some drill work. My reading on how learners construct knowledge has in, impacted my feelings on using models and analogies. The fact that relating it to something a, an elementary student knows already, what do they bring to the learning process? They are not a, a, a bunch of empty black boxes that you're filling with information. It's not, learning is not about stuff anymore. Actually, I'm not sure it ever was, but it's kind of what we used to think it was. Uh, you can now Google stuff. It's about showing them how to use stuff including their prior experiences, or movies they like, or songs they like, or feelings that they've had, or dogs that they've petted. Mm -hmm. Any of you use that analogy for a fuller bow, pet a large do. dog? Yeah. What I happens if you pet a cat like this? Yep. It will probably scratch you. Um, observing student teachers, like I said, I learn from watching things they do well and things that are challenging to them. And one thing I've noticed through all of this, teaching and observing and reading, um, 
and something I found as an elementary teacher. Um, the more music you engage the kids with, the more music, the more they want to play, the more they'll give you back. So I want to do a little activity here. Uh, if you could take a second, you can scribble something down if you want, you don't have to. What is happening here? Nonverbal. Take a minute and construct a little story in your head. student and, and now assistant, uh, Katerina uh, from Fredonia. What, what do you see going on here, Katerina? So <coughs> when I first saw it, I kind of thought that the man on the right picked up his daily morning newspaper and was just strolling along, reading it, maybe on his way to work or whatever. And the girl who's on the left to him is actually in the paper. And he's looking at the paper, kind of stops, looks at her, realizes there's the same person, and she's enjoying all the attention. Mm. She is making herself an open. Thank you. Anybody have a different take, a unique take? Yes, what's your name? Dan. Dan. They were reading it together, they saw a picture of a woman looking funny, and she's doing an impression of it. Oh, she's nice. It's <laughs> kind of an exaggerated pose that she's making, I guess. One more, anything unique to the others? <coughs> My guess is a lot of people in this room had very similar. Um, we've seen a lot of this world, unlike a lot of elementary students that might have 16 different interpretations of this, mm -hmm. where we are like, okay, I've seen this, I know what that look is, huh? that type of thing. And it goes to how kids, adults do, but kids will interpret nonverbal communication in different ways. How many of you have used a gesture and then gone home that afternoon and went, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> I got the opposite of what I wanted. And you have to exaggerate with, with kids with regards to gestures and sound and visuals. Uh, with regards to sound, I recall when, um, those of you old enough to remember when the first Suzuki CDs came out, mm -hmm. um, the, the David Nadjan recordings. When I was at Cincinnati getting my master's, there was a group of teachers that hated them because what was very exaggerated staccato in the original LPs and cassettes, <coughs> some of the younger suits are like, yes. <laughs> LP, were very exaggerated and dry, and suddenly here's David Nodgen, the ex-principal of the New York Philharmonic, with really soft staccatos and beautiful sound, and a lot of teachers didn't like that, because the kids are being encouraged to listen to those recordings, and suddenly they're being thrown a loop saying, well, wait, isn't this staccato? It's, he almost plays them too beautifully on there. So it can be an oral thing, but it also can be a visual thing. We can interpret visuals the same way. Visuals or analogies can reinforce what you want to say. Give me a gesture, somebody in here, when you teach your young string players. Something you do to supplement the words. Yes? That. Oh, that. <laughs> when you were giving me a gesture, you're like, awesome. <laughs> the street, right, show them the, the left wrist. Yes, ma'am. This. You know, when I'm teaching bow lifts, like a lot of You do this. it in their face. Yep. You know, like that. And, uh, you know, we learn as undergraduates in conducting class, you never count off, you do this, 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 and then you get out in the real world and realize, and no, you I have to count off. have to be much more of a gorilla. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> get on the podium and, and stir the big pot and do all of these things. And then hopefully as the kids move through your program and get older, then you can be a little more subtle in your gestures. Visuals or analogies can contradict your words. They can be a substitution for a verbose message in the name of efficiency. I can look at my youngsters and say, how do those tomatoes look? And suddenly pop. Mm -hmm. They're not squishing the tomatoes anymore. One of my students calls it squishing the hamster, which I think is kind of dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, squishing the tomato. Yeah. Add visuals or tactile element to the meaning of your words, so it can do the opposite. And it can accent or make your instruction stronger, <coughs> like what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a good day when you incorporate uh, Kramer into a yes. presentation. 
I love this because my, my younger students have no idea what Seinfeld is anymore. So some people oh, yeah. uh, A lot of the research comes from the, the idea of learner styles and preferences. You know, the good old visual learners, the people that need more words, the people that don't need analogies even. They just want to know exactly what to do. Suggesting that we encourage our students in deeper listening and thinking in sound as opposed to thinking about sound. Responding with something musically instead of always describing. As I mentioned before, it can supplement and re reinforce the message, not necessarily replace the message all the time. Words are still important. The constructivist idea of drawing connections between new material and prior knowledge. Your kids like to hear you playing for them as well. Mm -hmm. How many of you just pick up your instruments and play for them? Not, not necessarily just, you know, Happy Farmer or something that they're studying, but maybe something that you're studying if you're currently still playing or taking lessons or took lessons in college. I tried to start and end every semester when I taught with all of my classes by playing something I had worked on over the summer, normally a short Bach movement. I would walk right in the room, they'd be sitting there, but instead of saying, let's go through the syllabus, I would pull my violin or viola or cello or bass up and play something for them and say, good morning, it's great to see you all back. It's a great way to start the year. And I love it even when I made mistakes and I could say, hey, I just made a mistake and we're all gonna make a lot this year. Mm -hmm. You can also save your voice. How many teachers in here at the end of the day kind of go, <coughs> <coughs> I talk too much today. I learned that my first two or three years of teaching. My voice would be dead by three o'clock. It's because and research supports a lot of these ideas. The importance of oral models, of course, playing for your kids, having them echo things back to you, but also visual and tactile visual models. So let's make, draw some analogies and connections here. Provide some print resources for your kids. That's my first suggestion. This is a little app called Comic Life. It's now in its third version. I want to say it's maybe like $9 or something. It's a, it's a hefty, it's actually a software, um, a, a laptop or desktop. I'm not sure there's a comic light. iOS. Does anyone know in here? I saw some people nodding for comic light. Uh, it is a wonderful creativity tool. There's a lot of apps where you can turn a photo into a, like a painting. But this comes with a bazillion templates for all of these. This was an existing template. You simply drag your photo to that and it pops into that. You can resize it, you can twist it, you can colorize it, you can add all kinds of text, you can add like <coughs> Batman, Zowie, lightning bolts, all kinds of things. And I thought one day, you know, we're using Essential Elements Book 1. There's that nice drawing of the vi of the bubble holding the pencil. But there was something I wanted to convey and I was having to do it via words to supplement what was already in the book. Sometimes a lot of young teachers kind of think, you know what, I'm gonna do my own method book. Because I, I have my own ideas about this, and then after a few weeks you realize, oh my gosh, I don't have time to do all this. I'm just gonna use this excellent method book here. But creating these, yes? It's $4.99 from oh. the app store. It, so it is a mobile app? Yeah. $4.99. Mm -hmm. I'm not making any money from these apps. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a sponsored presenter or anything. Um, I just think that's a really neat thing. If you carbon date my hairline in the lower left there, this is about 15 years ago, <laughs> or 10 years ago, rather, when, when the app was brand new, when the software was new. So highly recommend uh, things like this. That's my bowhole steps that I would describe in class. Well, they could take this visual home, and instead of writing it down in their method books, here's kind of an attractive thing. And having your youngsters create stuff like this as well. Maybe creating comics with photos of them doing it instead of me and my hairy fingers here. So the bear claw, turn the bear claw upside down like you're holding an egg, gently. Everybody say this back to me, thumb is one. Thumb is one. Pinky two. Pinky two. Drop three for three. Drop three for three. And we do our flexercises and all of these old things that, that are so time tested and true. We did that in class, but then take, have them take that home to reinforce. Plus they get a kick out of the fact when their teachers design things for them. And I would write on the upper box there, I would say, for the fifth grade orchestra at Bryan Middle School, they would think that's really neat. It's published. <laughs> Provide visuals for your students. Uh, a lot of you decorate your rooms. I can always tell a future elementary general music teacher when they get so excited 
that the New Year's coming that they can decorate the room and then they post the pictures on Facebook. It's a great way, I think, to energize the new year, to not stay the same and stale year after year. And I encourage orchestra teachers to do that too. But with attractive colors and everything on the wall, do you have things on your wall that you can point to? Things that reinforce the verbal message or the oral me or the, um, the tactile message that you're giving. So if I hung this poster, Regina Carter, fantastic, mm -hmm. jazz violinist. If I looked at my violin section and went, hmm, to remind them of something, what's one thing, Jimmy, that you could look at that photo and kind of say, we want to have a posture play position like this. What's one thing she's doing? Um, she's got like that square thing in her elbow. She she the, nice square, the square elbow here. Okay. I also noticed the right wrist you know, you teach them that one violin will be able to roll over slightly. So maybe instead of using words, you simply say, let's look at Regina Carter and remember what she's doing and have them do that. Something that you can easily point to in class. <coughs> you know Professor Hanlon, go see his base presentation. He's one of my colleagues at Fredonia. This is him and Brett Shirtliff uh, from Western New York doing a base <coughs> Bass players in here, what is what is excellent about this picture? Besides the fact that there's two bases, and that's <laughs> and I think I think we call that unlawful assembly. Anything in there that you would point out to cello or bass players? Anything you'd point out here? Elbow up. Elbow up and around a little bit instead of tucked behind, perhaps. Cellists. I look at this right arm, and I just think a wonderful thing. The analogy that I use sometimes about the praying mantis or the ant, instead of playing like this, have the elbow pointed to the floor. With a Harley chopper, that wonderful right elbow, relax. I had this in my orchestra room of Anna Sophie Mutter. I think that's like the model posture playing position for illustrating the square from the shoulder to the elbow to here, the bow stick rolled over, the bow halfway between the bridge and the fingerboard, completely straight, so sometimes I just point. How many of you have pictures of your kids around your room, bow holds? What type of things do you have? Uh, arm positions, and hand positions. Arm and hand positions, both? Yep. Do you have the whole student or just parts? Both. Both. The whole student and parts. Negative models can be fun. I'm not sure you want to hang these around permanently, but maybe every once in a while. <laughs> that I think that's the champion of all those stock photos because, okay, there's no bridge there. <laughs> Took you a minute, right? And it looks like she's trying to like climb <laughs> over the cello here. And it's pointed out. And is she even wearing clothes under her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Straps, right? I think I see straps. I think I see straps. Okay. We both. Um, but a fun game with the kids. I would take stock photos and show them and tell us what, instead of just having me do it, show them something actually in print and say, fix that. What would you fix about that? Even little kids would be like this. Her bow is pointed to the floor. It's not straight. Her cello is too high. The, the, C, the C peg should be lined up with the ear. Having them confirm through visuals. Have <coughs> your students make their own teaching video. Yeah, I showed this in class the other day and a whole bunch of my students went better. He's one of our Fredonia students, currently student teaching on Long Island. Edgar Garcia. Make your own teaching videos. I'm sure a lot of you do that already. Uh, make a YouTube channel. Kids love that to see their, their teacher at home. If you if your school has its own YouTube channel, if your school has its own uh, web presence that you know for legal reasons you may have to upload it there, so it's approved first. You have to be careful with that. You always know. One lesson I learned early in my teaching career is you don't just pop in a. a, a a videotape. I'll explain what a videotape is later. <laughs> but you don't just pop in a videotape of Fantasia because it's rated G. Because there's a couple of scenes in it of the skeletons when they come out of the, um, the, the graveyard uh, that look like they're not wearing any clothes. <laughs> and they detail body parts. And my little fifth graders exploded laughing. And I pulled the videotape out and I went down to the principal's office and said, I'm going to be fired. And he looked at me and he looked at me and said, you're fine. But always preview what you show first. Come up with your own feeling for something. Can anyone, can you think? Well, it was damp? Yeah. I not really made up their own game, but just one time I noticed a couple of bass players like turned towards each other when they were learning Mary Had a Little Lamb and they were like, bass battle. 
and they smell. <laughs> As if they were doing rest, so they took turns playing Mary Had a Little Lamb at each other, and they would like decide who played it better. And nice. Mm -hmm. And then you pull out the Roy Clark, who just passed away, and um, uh, Earl Scruggs banjo battle back and forth. And yeah. You, would, you equate it to something like that. Bass battle. <laughs> I, th I would think your middle school orchestra teaching antenna would go up and say, wait a minute, <laughs> I might need to step in. What are they doing? <laughs> 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 have so a great resource for the tactile element, getting them to feel, using games that way. We all use analogies like that, but these are actually scripted games that you can use. So let's do some of these. Uh, I'd like um, a couple of volunteers. DJ. Sure. Jimmy, do you have your violin? Um, we'll take a second. I think I should have had everybody through this one time. How about? Oh, you do have your Kaylee. Join us. Not the violin. That might be the first time those words were ever uttered <laughs> with a smile on the face. Does anyone have issues right now with more kids wanting to play viola and cello? Than violin. Yeah. yeah. We're, noticing, we're noticing that so the string camp that I run in Fredonia and in talking to colleagues around the country, um, that we get a lot of applicants for viola, cello, bass all of a sudden, fewer violins. And I've talked to some orchestra teachers in Western New York that say the same thing. I don't know why that is. Is it violin just too kind of everybody plays violin? I want to be different. There's an adolescent trait for you. There you go. Speaking of adolescents. Um, Let's come up here, be very mindful of the wires. We are not a wireless room. We're a wire-full room here. Let's, uh, let's form a little diamond. No, let's do this. Let's face the audience, kind of a center circle. Let's put our instruments up and out on our shoulders. We're ready to play Mary Had a Little Lamb, which we're just going to go. Rest. Rest. One lift. The rest version of the non-A string version. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's habit to say hip hopotomous when I look at my feet. So um, we're gonna put our instruments up on our shoulders, and on the count of three, the posture's okay, but we're gonna give what's called the attitude sniff. So on the count of three, we're all gonna go one, two, three, I'm the best. And you have to say it, so could you all say that with us? Ready? One, two, three. I'm the best. Used to do that with kids to establish the up and out feeling. Plus, it's adorable at a concert when I'd be at the keyboard ready to play with them at their first concert, like in the picture behind you here. And I'd be on this side, and I'd say, "Hold on, one second, parents. Sorry, we do a little attitude sniff to show us our posture." And all of a sudden, they would all do that. I've had some of our Fredonia students who are out teaching on Long Island and Western New York now that say they do it with their kids and they love that game. I picked it up from a, a predecessor, bless you, of mine. So just reinforcing that the I'm the best instrument up and out type. Uh, here we go. I actually see this more in my college beginning violin class than I saw with my beginners. Um, what am I doing? Elbow. elbow. Locked at the elbow. So pre-teaching can be so important. Before you do any playing, I would encourage my students to, and some of them can actually take a, a, a one of these markers that go away with just rubbing it very quickly, draw a face and a mouth <coughs> right in the elbow pit here. And let's all just do this with your right elbows. Just down and up. And look at your elbow pit and imagine that it's a mouth opening, closing. Now munch. Munch, 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 munch. You gotta make the sound effect. You can insert your favorite food here. Then, and this is before I've ever done anything with the bow. Then I would have them, okay, let's put our bow in the string. I'd manually assist the student. Why am I talking about it when I get demonstrated? TJ, can you be a beginning of the old player? Put your feet right here and rotate towards me. And put your instrument up nice and high out in your shoulder and give us an attitude sniff. I'm just kidding. And set your bow in the D string. And now you remember that munch thing that we did? So obviously when you're doing this for the first time with a kid, you... And it always sounds that good. Um. First time you do it. But pre-teaching this, actually, you don't have to say, now remember to keep this or make sure you do that. You've actually, remember that mouth? There's the visual. There's the feeling that they've got here. They'll actually look down on it. Thank you, TJ. Give it up for...
Thank you very much. I did this at a beginning violin technique class this year. I know I stole it from somebody. So some of you in here would be like, yeah, this is from so-and-so, or I read this someplace. But uh, I had two uh, saxophone and flute players who came in the next day. I didn't use that at first. I was just holding their elbow and saying, you have to bend at your elbow, bend at your elbow. And through two or three weeks, it was like this. The minute I used the mouth analogy, it worked. And it's one of those moments as a teacher, I just went, OK, now I want to go back in the public schools for a year and, and try this with a new class. So let's keep you up here. Travel and pluck. Jimmy, I'm going to have you illustrate this for me. You can set your bow down for a second. Switch a little over. Instrument up on your shoulder. Can you, yeah, get away from the light there. There you go. Um, on the higher two strings, two, ready, go. Provoked it is. Now, can you reach as far as you can? As far as you can. You have big hands, so it'll be easy. <laughs> A lot of kids will get to here and you'll have to say, no, keep going, keep going, all the way to the top of the fingerboard. So they, they realize they have to bring that thumb underneath for a back. Ready, go. Now do four of these and then immediately. are almost falling and stuff like that. But what you're doing there is what? Shifting. You're pre-teaching, shifting before you say, we're shifting to this note here. There's a million different ways of teaching shifting. None of them are wrong. It's whatever works for your pedagogy. But I love the pre-teaching concept. The doing something before you describe what you're going to do. Good morning. Today we're going to talk about what's called shifting. What you just did is called shifting. As opposed to, good morning ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to talk about shifting. Uh, that would be very nice to be our teachers were very, I'm going to tell you for 15 minutes what we're going to do today, and you're going to pay attention, or else um, I was paddled. I go back that far. Uh, yes, I was. I was not the perfect student. So, pre-teaching the elbow leading the shift that way. There's getting the visual and the physical, the feeling of that before you're using words. The motorcycle handlebars. Let's all write a, a Harley chopper in here, free up both hands. Relax your elbows. Do you ever ride one of those motorcycles where you sit back like this? And I might show a visual of it on the screen and then rotate. Crank up, crank up the speed here. Well, that's for teaching two things. Your cello bow hold, mm -hmm. where you drop the fingers over. Or you can use bicycle for this. But it's also for this. Tilt the stick away from you ever so slightly. Imagine that feeling. Now what happens? Maybe a little over. So you might have to do a little correction there. Believe it or not, none of these work as smoothly as they do with Mr. Mudd here, <laughs> with little kids. Have students create their own reminders for these. What do I look like? I was told that when I conduct it, I look like a big albatross. <laughs> so if I want my kids to use more bow, I would say, hey, more bow here. Let's be big albatrosses in that spot. The visual or the analogy. The NASA equipment. Always mindful of the knock the speakers. So I'm going to ask. Um, let's have Kaylee do this. Kaylee, could you grab your viola and your bow? Actually, just your bow. I'm doing a little improvising here. Now I'm going to give you this. Uh, there's a piece of equipment that I had, the school had to purchase. Uh, it's made of space age materials developed by NASA, in which um, you just have to be very careful that you don't drop these. And by that time, my fourth graders go, that's a toilet paper roll. I'm like, no, it's not. But see any toilet paper. It's very delicate, but obviously, OK. Um, some of you have done this before, the toilet paper roll. Could you take that and pretend like you're talking on the phone with it? Now, see, here's where we have to change. A lot, a lot, a lot of kids talk on the phone like this anymore. So maybe just having it on their shoulder. But for, for now, let's pretend like we talk on telephones like this. Hold your bow in your fist. I would do this even more teaching the bow hold. Pre-teaching bow direction. Can you set the tip of that in there and make sure that 
Make sure this doesn't move around. You keep it against your face. Now push up, pull down. Push up, pull down. Push up, push up. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> I always do that. Pre-teaching straight bow, you're also forcing the elbow to bend. It's an old Suzuki thing, this, the toilet paper roll. Uh, I've noticed in the past few years that people are starting to not use this old game. I think it's wonderful. Um, I remember asking, I did not save my toilet paper rolls a couple of years ago, and I asked my methods class students, hey, do any of you have any toilet paper, empty toilet paper rolls around your apartment? And Bailey Marshall goes, uh, well, I will. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I encourage them to save them. Thank you, Caleb. The wiggle, stop, and pop. Let's have TJ do this and deal with What I'd like you to do on your lowest string, we're trying to develop tone here with this little game. How about you, on your G string or your C string? Let's do the C string for you. I want you to set your heavy bow, drop your bow as heavy as you can, with so much friction that you're trying to go up and down bow, but you can't make a sound except for those annoying little ones. The minute you say that, they'll all try to make the annoying little ones. Yeah. So let them get it out of their system. And then wiggle, stop, and try to make one pop like this. And that was three. <laughs> so every time you have to stop, wiggle, that was two. Stop, wiggle, and that was two. Stop, wiggle, and now see I cheat a little bit if you notice I laid my hand on the bridge for support. And most kids are going to go like that and get several. Now, on the count of three, play it open C with me. Ready, longbow, go. Yeah. What you'll end up with is a contact point there in that type of sound. And you could refer to that if something's forte in your music. Remember that heavy friction sound that we got with the stop, wiggle, and pop? Getting it to move. Give it up for TJ. She had a note slur. Jimmy and Kaylee both. Teaching slurs, page whatever in essential elements. We look at the slurs. We, 21. 21? You've got it memorized. <laughs> I used to have the numbers memorized. I don't have it anymore. I can tell you where Can Can was or for Pete's sake. For Pete's sake. Let's play for Pete's sake. Um, you can teach slurs the way it's written in the book. When I was a kid, we always looked at the music while we were learning the concept. And research and practices told us Pestalozzi was right. Sound before symbol. Rest, rest. Rest, rest. And of course, being judicious with vibrato, because the minute you start vibrating, you're going to have some kids go, what is that thing you're doing with your hand? Yeah. You have to decide when it's important to add that. But rest, rest. Or you can do something like this. Good morning, folks. Let's all set our bows. We know our D scale already. We have pretty good command of the bow. Play this back to me. Ready? Drop your first finger. Halfway through the bow, go. Can you do three notes? Ready, go. A lot of little kids will do this, and they'll run out of bow. So what do you have to do with your bow, Kaylee? Go slower. Go slower. What do you have to do with your bow, Kaylee? Go slower. What do you it's an old TV gag. What does the yellow light mean? Slow down. What does the yellow light mean? That makes me up. You have to explain a joke. My Cajun godfather always ruins jokes. He starts, and he's got a thick Cajun accent. He starts a joke, and then he, now wait a minute. No, the guy walked into the bar, and by the way, just tell me the punchline. Uh, four notes. Ready, go. Five notes. Ready, go. And then, of course, with little kids, you're going to have to do each one a couple of times. Not everybody's going to get it as perfectly as these college students are. Getting them to do that. I would get up to the A and I'd say, all right, uh, for tomorrow, I'd like to see who could come in here and do all 15 notes of the scale. And you'll have a bunch of kids that will run home with their instruments and try to come back. Yes, they did it. But that's for the end of class. Now, go back and play two notes together. And then you say, you've just played the first measure of song. 
Ninety something. Ninety something. <laughs> Ninety something. Page twenty one. <laughs> and so they've internalized that. And do the same thing with the upbow. Let's try an upbow. Add a note. Add another note. Et cetera, et cetera. So you're pre-teaching that again. Again, doing before you describe. Games for feeling. Last one here. Um, how am I doing on time? Is Mr. Beck still here? 854. 854. Oh, we're, we're fantastic. It's a tuning slide. Um, I don't have a keyboard here, so we're going to improvise. How are we going to improvise? Hmm. Yeah. I'm, you know what? I'm going to step over here. Let's do this. Uh, Jimmy and Kaylee, could you come over here? If you can, lean over a little bit here. I would be behind an upright piano or a clavinova, and I'd be hitting a piano A and with a sustained pedal on, so there'd be an A. So Kaylee, could you keep plucking an A for us? Yeah, just pluck an A. A. A little bit louder, sir. So Okay, Jimmy is a little fifth grader in here. He's going to set his instrument down here. He's just going to walk up to the piano. And what I do with the instrument up high on the piano, I take my bow and I pull it across the D string. Keep doing it. Kaylee's plucking. I'm hitting the piano A. And I ask Jimmy, Jimmy, could you put your first finger right here on the string? Like it's a steel guitar. Can you slowly slide up until you match that pitch? pre-teaching and pre-checking ability to match pitch. You are going to get those kids that are going to go They can't find the pitch. Now what do you do as a teacher? Wrong. No, you don't do that. Right. Join band. <laughs> you don't do that. Actually, I had one of those uh, Meisel string instruments, uh, collapsible rulers that have the instrument sizing thing that you can use to kind of measure arm length. And it says for viola, like 15 inch, 15 and a half inch, 16, 16 and a half. My band director colleague got hold of it, and above that wrote, join band. <laughs> <laughs> so you, the student that's having trouble, no, you don't kick them out of orchestra, but you make a mental note that, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, TJ, uh, because very few students are called Mr. Mudd, um, <laughs> TJ is having difficulty with intonation. I may have to do some of our intonation work with him on matching pitch. So it's a great way to also establish this. I use finger dots. Some teachers don't. I want keys there at the beginning because I want them to focus on straight, both beautiful tone. Then when the dots fall off, Mr. Webb, my dots fell off. Good. Now you can start sliding around and adjusting for intonation. Some teachers believe the other way, and they're producing fantastic students, too. It's whatever fits your pedagogy, and more importantly, whatever fits your kids in the classroom. It's 99 cents. <laughs> there was much rejoicing. <laughs> uh, and be sure, if you do that, get Staff Wars Live. Staff Wars is just identify the note names. Good for note reading. But Staff Notes Live uses your microphone, or you can hook a USA, not a USB, a, a um, uh, lightning microphone to your iPhone or, or um, Android device, and literally and when it's in tune, then it'll explode if it's not out of tune. So it's, the, the graphics are very 1980s video game looking like that, but it can be a nice quick game to use with your kids in the classroom. And you can put it on the big screen, so it's not just individual work. A lot of kids will want to download it and do it, but you can actually make it part of class. Is R.E. out of tune there? Let's play that cellos and see. So using digital technologies, and obviously using things like GarageBand for creativity, getting kids involved in creating. Yes, can you choose what note it does, or does it choose? It chooses for you. I haven't. I haven't done that. Hannah, do you know uh, if you I, can I actually choose the can. note? I, yeah, I think it just chooses for you. It's just kind and of a random thing. However, you can set, set, you can yeah, set you the can range. Set the range. Mm -hmm. And in the opening screen, it actually has a treble clef, a tenor clef, an alto clef, the king of all clefs, <laughs> and I'm a viol uh, player, and a, and a bass clef. And you can also adjust the range. So I guess you can choose notes if you want to choose like between two notes. You can do that. Getting to the end here, um, send a note home to your parents with regards to these tactile visual images. 
your parents a lot of times, well, I, she's practicing, Mr. Webb. I, you know, she seems to play Rondino every, every second of the day, driving us crazy, walking around the house, practicing 300 minutes a week. I used to tell parents, that's wonderful. Don't be alarmed when it goes down a little bit when they get to the sixth grade hump. When it's not quite new anymore, you nudge them over that hump a little bit. Um, but what you can do is give the parents in a letter, maybe a list of buzzwords, and say, ask your student, is your bow making a T with the strings? And they ask the student to show their parent this. The parent might not be able to assess their progress, but they can use that buzzword. Ask them to do the attitude sniff for you. Why is the attitude sniff important? The up and out when we play upper strings and strings. The cellos, the bass has always felt left out, so I always made sure they assumed proper right and left arm position when we did the attitude sniff. The swing in the pendulum. Ask the kid to swing back and forth. A lot of you do this with your youngsters. Have them get to, you know, make sure your fingers are over the string you want to play. Have them do the, the pendulum. The open and closed mouth thing. Like this. Unsquishing the tomato and the motorcycle handlebars. These are all things easily parents or guardians can say to their children to reinforce stuff at home. Tactile images. Could you turn to somebody next to you? Why don't you volunteer somebody you were just in our last five minutes here. Volunteer somebody you were just talking to who you thought had a really good one. Here. There are people pointing at you in the plaid red. What's your name? Evan. Evan. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of a game, but um, for my bassist, we do the bass player salute for handshake. They do uh, left thumb at the base of the temple, then eyebrow, nose, lip, lip. And that way, three and four are together. Space from one to two, two to four, thumbs across from the middle finger. Uh, would you stand up here? And <laughs> uh, That's I'm awesome. frantically writing right now, so let's not rely on words. Would you mind? I don't mind. Turn toward the turn toward the front. Okay, I'll take my glasses off too. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, left thumb, or I guess. Would I mirror for them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know what? You okay. do a lot of this, by the way, and then you have to be careful of turning your back to your kids. But sometimes yeah. you have to explain to them because they will put the opposite hand. Yeah, I, I, I just do everything other way now. Fantastic. Mirror it. So left thumb at the base of the temple, index finger on the eyebrow, middle finger on the nose, other fingers lip lip. And then you got your three and four together, you have their space from one to two, two to four, nice. thumbs across from middle finger, and then they can identify other bases by just, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. The base handshake. Yeah. Oh, how cool would that be if you're, if you're principal? What is this? Is that a gang sign? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you answer, yes. <laughs> Any others? One more? Somebody had a good one? Yes. My new friend had um, hide the rosin. So, uh, do you want to explain it? It's a great one. Um, if you take a have a kid go out, go out in the hallway um, for a second, take their rosin and put it somewhere in the room. The closer the kids get to it, the louder they play to the rosin. So and it's then colder, have, warmer. Yeah. With so hotter, hiding cold, the rosin. but with hide the rosin. Nice, and using that for teaching dynamics. dynamics. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes. I also use it for teaching um, the same height rosin game for how fast you move your bow. Mm -hmm. So you move it slowly if they're far away, cold, faster, and also for pitch, so they can do the siren up the string, mm -hmm. so that they're you know relaxed and holding here, but they're running up. So the it's house. a little the bit higher, like this. The closer they are, the higher they go. Yeah, exactly. but but actually getting them Not moving just around the room a little bit. Hide the rosin. <laughs> they love Excellent. it. Excellent. They love it. <laughs> uh, I like that. Absolutely these. love it. Hide the rosin. Then at the end of the class, you're like, I forgot to pick the rosin. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a million pieces. Or, or somebody ate it thinking it was a Jolly Ranger. <laughs> so to summarize, some suggestions do, feel, see before you describe something. Of course, there are going to be times that you need to use your words. You know, a little bit higher with the pitch there. Everything has to be done out of efficiency. There's only so many minutes in a lesson. With beginners and elementary kids especially. But good old sound before symbol. Uh, Pestalozzi was really on for something. A lot of people since have talked about that. But how much of teaching can you do where you demonstrate, you feel, you visualize, in addition to listening before? Throw in a good analogy. Have students come up with their own. What does that feel like to you? Describe what that feels like in their own words. Provide your own visuals. Provide your own videos. Provide print resources. Get a little creative. Kids love that when you do stuff for them.
Look what my teacher did. Look at this funny picture of my teacher holding the instrument the wrong way. Make your own bad cello stock photo and have the kids figure it out. But please wear clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Always credit. Steal some good games. I can guarantee you that I'm going to mention these to my string method students, but I am going to say these aren't mine. I stole them for people on here. This is how we feed the profession. We steal. We adapt. Involve kids in negative modeling, as I mentioned with that uh, stock photo thing. Have them do something <coughs> wrong first and then feel what it feels like to correct it. Everybody squish your tomatoes. Make the sound effect. <laughs> Tomato juice running down your hand. Now fix it. Because students will show you what you show them. It's like I mentioned at the beginning, when I was really calm, they will give that back to you a little bit if you ask them to do it. If you're frantic, they'll give that back to you. It's the same way with visuals. If you show them something, they do. Fundamentally, kids are suckers for the truth, a line I stole from a movie. They're suckers for facts. They want to know things. They want to know how to do something. Some resources I have over here on the table, as I mentioned. Um, playing the string game, it needs to come back in print. Maybe I'll send out a petition for that. The new edition of the Gillespie and Hammond textbook, some of you might have used when you were undergrads back in the day, but the new edition is chock full of these. Um, Don and Bob Gillespie keep adding wonderful resources for teachers in there. And then use your music education journals. All kinds of MEJ are ASTA journal. I'm so sorry that I didn't put an ASTA. That I, feel, I feel shame now. I didn't put the ASTA journal in here. But there's all kinds of games and elements for modeling not only in print, but also online. So use your journals in that. Thank you so much.